Lee is a human rights lawyer. She is the member of the Human Rights and Orang Asli Committees in the Bar Council. Currently, she is involved in many of the land rights issues affecting the Orang Asli. She often stands as the watching brief for the Bar Council in public interest cases as well. So thank you, Ms. Siti, for being the moderator for this session. I will pass on to her to introduce the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. Um, thank you very much for staying on for this last session, and I hope you won't fall asleep. You know, and uh, it's usually it's the hardest to, uh, to to maintain the last session. Anyway, I shall introduce. Um, uh, first, I welcome uh, Tan Sri Simon Sipaon. Uh, Dato' Shaifuddin, Gerald Joseph, and Tista Setalbet. No, no, no. No? Moja, you're holding it. Oh, I was given this. <laughs> Everybody has the right program. I'm so sorry, oh my god. See, they emailed me with this one, and they have changed. Uh, so, and what's the name? Muja, is that? Muja. 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 Oh, Nicholas Muja. Sorry, Nicholas. <laughs> okay, so do we have our panel of speakers here. Uh, as you know, this uh, session is about the cohesion in multicultural society and uh, overcoming the challenges. So I, I guess you guys have read the objective of this uh, session. Um, and. Um, I will actually introduce you first uh, to Tansri Simon Stipaon. Uh, Tansri, I'm not sure whether I should read this, uh, was born in 1938 uh, to illiterate farmers in the interior of Sabah. No, today is his birthday. Today is his birthday? Yeah. Wow! Oh. Shall we sing a happy birthday for Tansri? Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday to you Happy birthday to you Happy birthday to Tan Sri Happy birthday to you So you got a birthday boy here <laughs> Anyway, uh, so Tan Sri Yes, uh, Tan Sri Simon um, retired in 1993 as state Secretary of Sabah, a position he held for five years. When the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia, i.e. Suhakam, was formed in 2000, Tansri Simon was one of the first commissioners to be appointed. He served Suhakam for 10 years, including six years as vice chairman. Presently, he is serving a second three-year term on the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, MACC Advisory Board. This appointment will end in February 2015. In 2011, he became founding chairman of Persatuan Ha Asasi Manusia, i.e. Proham, Society for the Promotion of Human Rights, an NGO formed by former human rights and police commissioners. And um, shall I introduce to Datuk Saifuddin? I, I, maybe you don't need introduction, lah, Datuk. No? Everybody knows you. So, Datuk Saifuddin, is the CEO of Global Movement of Moderates, or GMM. He is also Chairman of Youth Academy, Senior Research Fellow, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, University of Malaya, former member of AMNO Supreme Council, uh, uh. <coughs> uh, and <laughs> I'm very, very balanced here, okay? And former Deputy Minister of Higher Education. He is a progressive politician, who advocates the idea of new politics, youth empowerment, and social entrepreneurship. He is also actively promoting debate culture and basketball. Before becoming a politician, he was president of the Malaysian Youth Council, member of the United Nations Secretary General's high-level panel on youth employment, okay. consultant of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, and a student activist. He was also a businessman, university administrator, teacher and editor. 
I don't know what you know what time he has to spend for his family. You know, with all these activities. <laughs> right. Uh, the next one is our. Um, well, okay, Mr. Nicholas Muja. My God, this is so short compared to others. Uh, Mr. Nicholas is uh, an international board member, permanent Indigenous People Council of Forest Steward Council International, Saadia activists, defending land rights cases, steering committee for JAWS. That is Jaringan Orang Asli, uh, Orang Asal, sorry, Orang Asal, Sir Malaysia. Um, yeah. And last and but not least, our very own Mr. Gerald Joseph. Yay. Yes, uh, he is uh, a board of director of Pusat Komas. Um, he is very experienced human rights activist and trainer, specializing in human rights issues such as racism, indigenous people's rights, and other crucial human rights issues. I can vouch for that. He also has extensive experience working on human rights issues in different countries in Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific and Africa. He possess a master degree in human rights. One of his passion is, passion is developing youth and students to become socially involved in Malaysian human rights issues. So there you are, you now know a little bit about our panel. So shall we start uh, with Tan Sri Simon? Um, and uh, to hear what he has to say about the issue at hand. Uh, uh, <coughs> Thank you very much, Madam Moderator, um, fellow panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You can see my only qualification here is age, <laughs> which I happen not to like. <laughs> I had to be a lot younger. And I said last night, I was 25 years of age when this country was formed. In other words, I'm 25 years older than Malaysia. <laughs> all right. Now, we all know Malaysia is a land of multis, if I can use that word. It's multiracial, multireligious, multiethnic, multilingual, multicultural, the list goes on. In addition, um, there is also the geographical factor. Sabah and the peninsula are separated by sea, almost 2,000 kilometers uh, distance. Sabah alone has about 40 ethnic uh, groups with their own tradition, customs, uh, culture, language, norms, whatever. So these are um, so different in dialect and so religion. The two regions, Peninsula, Sabah, hardly anything in common the way I look at it. You know, um, if any, except the fact that they were former British territories, British colonies. The same could be said for Sarawak. Now, if you think about it, these are potentially divisive factors rather than a uniting factor. Um, so these are what I call real challenges for the achievement of unity or even cohesion. As far as I'm concerned, cohesion and unity is basically the same thing. Cohesion is something that glues us together and same with unity in my view. Now. Under the circumstances, national unity cannot be expected to come about naturally. Um, conscious and deliberate efforts need to be made to forge, in my view, genuine national unity as well as integration. Now, such process is a very time-consuming. Malaysia is only 51 years of age. Although 51 years for a country, I think, is young, although quite old for a human being. The government, I think, at the same time must be commended for its effort in promoting uh, national unity as well as integration. Amongst others, there is a minister in charge of national unity. 
There is also a Department of National Unity and Integration. On top of that, you have the NUCC, which has just been uh, established. And I agree with Amiga and the rest that the objective, I think, is good. You know, but having been having been born now, um, it doesn't look as if uh, it is um, being taken care of the way it should uh, deserve uh, looking after. So, what appears um, to me, uh, our unfortunately, a genuine unity, I think, and integration remain to be elusive dream uh, and remain a digit, um, it's a distant uh, possibility. I think uh, right now we witness a nation deeply divided, highly polarized as never before. However, at the same time, I remain convinced that strong unity in a multiracial multicultural ladder society is still possible and achievable. It is doable, despite the challenges that I have just uh, elaborated. They could be overcome. It is up to the government, the leaders, and the people to rise up to the occasion. Uh, what is needed, in my view, is good governance, fair and just leadership, leadership for the country, rather than leadership for a particular race because I think when you are a minister or prime minister of a country you should lead based on everybody every citizen and most of all I think strong political will however it is difficult if not impossible to get citizens to cooperate if they feel that they are marginalized they are discriminated based on their race and their religion. I need to skip a lot of my notes um, having regard to the time constraint. Uh, G national unity, I think in my view, must come from the heart. It must be from your feeling inside. And not through what I call attractive, nice, make a good feeling, this feeling uh, of slogans and rhetorics that only being spoken about but not acted on. The citizen must feel that the government really take care of them, of them and in return I think the people will appreciate and, and understand and cooperate with the government. See, the riot, the citizens are human beings and they are not inanimate objects. They got feelings. Uh, they are unlike tables, they are unlike chairs. You throw them around. They don't respond because they have no feeling. But in the case of human beings, they do have feelings. And assimilation to achieve unity does not, is not appropriate in the case of Malaysia, I, I believe. Um, because the minorities are very sizable in this country, unlike in Thailand, for example, unlike in, uh, in Indonesia. Um, now, let me, uh, considering what I said earlier about my age, wala, lima minutes lagi, my goodness. Um, okay, let me just have a glimpse of life in North Borneo before it became part of Malaysia. You know, I must... Uh, and in North Borneo, there was no fear of being arrested without fair trial, okay? No community claimed superiority over the rest. There was no such thing as Ketuanan Melayu. No racial, ethnic, religious problems. Intermarriages were common. The word Allah was never an issue. There was no forced conversion into the Muslim faith. Nobody quarreled and dispute over dead bodies. No bride was ever snatched away by religious authorities on her wedding day. <laughs> Civil service multiracial. Banyak lagi ni, but time lima minit tidak cukup. Etc. No community, community, no individual 
felt deprived and marginalized because of race and religion. Now, um, there was no such thing as MACC, and yet there was hardly any corruption. The pride of the civil servant were how good they are in their work and how are they able to be of service to the um, Tiga minit lah. Okay. Now, uh, now, when I said the same thing towards the, the end of last month, the last two weeks I was visited in my house by two, uh, twice, by the special branch and police officers, saying that what I said just now was seditious. So now, speaking in public appeared to me like walking in a field full of mines. So, you never can know when you step on the mine. Um, now, just let me, I must uh, not leave without uh, giving some indic some suggestion as to how this country could be made better for us to live in. Now, I got a, a long wish list here, but I mentioned a few. I think it's high time for us to leave, um, stop playing the religious and uh, racial cards in politics. Um, there should be, in my view, a sound education system at par with the best in the world. Good governance should be the order of the day. Government uh, with um, government should accede to and ratify the core human rights treaties and instruments. Malaysia should become a party to the UN Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. All laws that give authority to the government to arrest citizens without trial should be repealed. Selective, and this is important in my view, selective application of the laws and prosecution should not occur. Um, the, uh, to me, this is important. There is a program known as the Biro Tata Negara. In my view, this should be reviewed in terms of its contribution towards the promotion and maintenance of genuine uh, national unity and good relation. Meritocracy should be uh, observed. The RCI report on Sabah illegals should be released without further delay. Um, ada lagi, um, wait, uh, um, <laughs> Human Rights Action Plan should be formulated and implemented without further delay. The electoral rules should be cleaned up. Um, excessive gerrymandering, I think, should be rectified by limiting the number of voters um, in respect of state as well as par parliamentary uh, level. Postal voters should only comprise the people who are actually working on the voting day rather than the whole police and their family, the whole army and their family become postal voters. Now, um, I think in view of the time, I think, uh, and finally, the Sedition Act. There was no Sedition Act in North Borneo. That's another plus point for North Borneo. Um, it should be, to me, repealed sooner. And the Prime Minister should honor his, uh, I think, should honor his uh, 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 penny, uh, janji, janji. And I hope uh, people like uh, <coughs> Datu Saifuddin Abdullah, yeah, very close to him, can uh, draw his attention how important it is for his public image to not to prom promise and uh, 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 fulfill it. Uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Actually, I envy Tasri, you know, uh, in his age, you know, like, I'm like a lot younger than him, but I have to use glasses to read, you know, but he doesn't have to use glasses. I'm surprised. Wow. You know, I mean, incredible. I must ask you the secret. Anyway, um, so as what Tansri said just now, you know, it is achievable, but we have to have a leadership like Mandela. Can you see any Mandela in Malaysia right now? Um, well, anyway, so I shall now proceed to our second speaker, uh, Datuk Shaikuddin. Uh, if you uh, may proceed, thank you. Oh, but I'm not sure whether she is a moderate one. <laughs>
I have never seen Gerald so well dressed. <laughs> To the extent that I asked him, were you in the court? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you anyway uh, for having me. You know, uh, my chairman and my deputy chairman, I'm referring to Dr. Mujahid and Chiwi uh, in the Law and Policy Committee at NECC, has spoken before you earlier. And I'm only a member of that committee. I'm not sure if I will be <clears throat> repeating what they were saying or, or, or what. But let me start by saying that, uh, well, I, I'm going to just share a few things. But let me start by uh, <coughs> saying that uh, sometimes the challenge is, uh, the challenge lies in one's worldview uh, at things. If one is not comfortable of having other people around, people belonging to other religion and other race, you know, no matter how you talk to him, he will not be comfortable. Yeah. And because of that, I think, uh, though this may sound like a rhetoric, but all Malaysians have to accept the fact that we are all Malaysian, we are here to stay, no one is going back to anywhere. Any yeah. we have, this, this, this is the truth of the truth that we all have to accept. Yeah. Because so long as you feel that, you know, I'm so uneasy lah, sitting beside you, and why you people are here, then, then you, you, you get into trouble. <laughs> yeah. It's about <coughs> worldview that we are here in this country uh, together as fellow citizens. Because then your approach will define your action. You have a choice, for instance, to have a harsh and simplistic approach to things, yeah. like uh, you want to be in control all the time, or you want simplicity, like, I, I'll give an example, close all vernacular schools, therefore there will be unity. Ah, it's not that simple. Because for someone who stays in Galas, in Gua Musang, what difference does it make? Because everybody is Malay and Klate like it. So you close all the Chinese and Tamil primary school, doesn't affect them. So it's not as simple as that. Yeah. Uh, but if we were to understand, uh, and I think this is my, my proposition for today, it is very important that we are able to balance what is considered sacred and pillars of the country, like the constitution and the Kunagara in our history, real history, yeah, not history uh, sometimes that is too official, uh, and our culture, and how we balance that <clears throat> with the new realities of today. Uh, I, I don't want to go into details of what the new realities of today are. Uh, if we are able to balance between uh, what is considered sacred and the pillars and what are the new realities of today, then I think we can come up with a more moderate, uh, sophisticated approach to things uh, that is happening around us. I'll give an example. We all subscribe to the idea of democracy. But at the same time, we have our rulers. And we have all agreed that, at least in the Constitution, that it is a constitutional monarchy. Flashback to the debate in some states. Nowadays, you have to be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> For some people who cannot come to grapple with what participatory and deliberative democracy, which is exactly the new stage of democracy that is happening now, then you will be able, then you won't be able to understand why it doesn't really matter if it is a lady or is a wife or who, whoever uh, would become, uh, you know, uh, uh, the chief of the tribe. See, I'm trying to be... Uh, <laughs> So if you are not able to grapple with uh, what is happening, then you have to probably fall back to something that was once in history. Then you go back, say, for instance, to the Caliph. I'm not talking about IS here. Yeah. 
And then you bring back this argumentation about uh, they used to be a caliph and, and so on and so forth. But that is not going to solve Islamic view on politics. Because the old caliph was there those days at a time when there was such thing as Kafir Harbi and Kafir Zimmi, when today there's no more Kafir Zimmi. Pardon me for using those terms because those are real terms anyway. You know why? Because whoever that is Kafir, I mean non-Muslim, they are not only paying tax, they are not only in contract with you, they are citizens, they have voting rights. So going back those, to, to those kind of uh, argumentation, it's not going to help. So you have to understand and you have to be able to be comfortable to live with what democracy is all about. So it's about value, number one. Number two, I think we also have to appreciate more of the human right perspective when we are dealing with race and religion. I give an example. Uh, Denison and I, and uh, with the support of uh, some people, uh, we are working, say for instance, coming up with a report on religious freedom in ASEAN member states. And there are a, a, a variety of uh, situations. For instance, there are countries that have state regulation in the field of religion. There are those who don't have. There are countries that have state favoritism towards a particular religious group. There are those who don't have. And there are countries that have some kind of social sanction or social regulation. Uh, it is precedent. Lah. It's not written anywhere, but it's happening. Yeah? Now, how do we navigate, uh, for instance? Now, one may say that, oh, uh, <coughs> religion has got nothing to do with human rights. Yes, uh, to a certain extent, but we all know also that human right is not alien to any of the religion that we understand. Yeah. So we have to be able to look at this uh, perspective sometimes for us to understand how we can coexist and live uh, harmoniously together. Now my third point is, in the context of Malaysia, very quickly, Siti, it's okay, you have time. three things. Number one, the supremacy of the constitution is very important. Yeah. But when you are talking about the Constitution, I think there are three things on the supremacy of the Constitution. Number one, the interpretation. Last night, I was listening to Tan Sri Sipon and a few other speakers on <coughs> the Constitution vis-a-vis, -vis, say for instance, the Malaysia Agreement, 18 point for Sarawak and 20 point for uh, North Borneo, Sabah. Uh, is Sarawak and Sabah the 12 and 13 states in Malaysia or Malaysia comprises the three S, uh, Semenanjung, Sabah and Sarawak? This is, you know, I, I can tell you I almost have sleepless night, yeah? Thinking about uh, what was I taught uh, a single, as a single major history student in UM, what was I taught uh, in, in my history lesson, for instance. I'm, I'm not making any conclusion, I'm just uh, repeating what uh, was said last night. Uh, number two, uh, sorry, on interpretation, say for instance, uh, the special position uh, of the Malay and the natives of Sabah and Sarawak. Some people use the term uh, rights. Uh, rights and position are two different things. And uh, the rights, sorry, special position in all areas or in limited areas. We all know that it's actually in limited areas. And then at limited areas, at what point? Say for instance, in the public service, it is only at entry point. Then you have to read 136, where 136 uphold the notion of meritocracy once you are admitted, for instance. So there are, there are ways of looking and interpreting the Constitution so that we get the best out of the Constitution. I remember listening to someone saying, our Constitution is not so beautiful, but neither <coughs> it is ugly. Yeah. Uh, we can make it more beautiful uh, as we go on. Second about the Constitution is, we should also be looking at laws that might contravene the Constitution. Uh, and number three is about not allowing people to rewrite the Constitution through backdoor channels. 
some people seems to be allowed to do it, nothing happened to him or her, and then it, it creates a precedent. Yeah, and, and this is not very good. Now, my second last point is about policies. I think uh, NUCC, uh, in the, uh, in, uh, there is this committee on inclusive development have come up with some very specific uh, policy uh, proposal to the government uh, yet to be uh, disclosed to public. But I think some of the policies are very important, uh, looking at, uh, for instance, uh, migration between, uh, uh, sorry, migration from race-based to mixed-based policies and, and so on and so forth. And finally, uh, my submission will be on the education. Uh, I agree that uh, education is premium when it comes to uh, fostering and nurturing unity. But as we discuss the education, I thought the priority would be on quality. Yeah. As we achieve quality education, hopefully we also achieve some kind of unity. I am always against the idea that when you talk about education, your priority is unity. Then you're not talking about uh, you know, quality. Yeah. Because again, it's about not having a simplistic uh, argumentation that if everybody learns together, they will be united. Not necessarily, yeah. Because there are many people who learn in different schools, but you know they are equal, no less patriotic, no less united in the way they look at themselves and their neighbors, and so on and so forth. And 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 I mean we can always make argument, but the point I'm trying to uh, register here, brothers and sisters, is that unity is not about uniformity. Sometimes we got mixed up that the best way to get unity and social cohesion and what have you is to make everybody the same. That's not the Malaysia that Tan Sri mentioned uh, Mandela. Mandela used sports to unite uh, South Africaners. Uh, and uh, the sport that he was using happens to be rugby. Uh, I'm using basketball. It's, uh, if, you, if you understand rugby in South Africa and basketball in Malaysia, it's like the, the other side of the coin. Yeah? There, the whites play uh, rugby. They were, the, they were the minority. The blacks don't. Here, uh, Chinese predominantly play basketball. Others don't. Uh, so if he can do it there, uh, he probably can use it here. Uh, but I'm not limiting myself only to basketball. I believe sports is a very important uh, platform. It so happened that I know basketball more than anything else. Uh, and I'm using basketball. Uh, as, as, a, as a platform uh, for unity among the kids. Um, so, Siti, uh, I know you can be not so moderate when time is up. <laughs> <laughs> and before you do that, I, I better <laughs> surrender. <laughs> and that's my case. Thank you. Thank you, Dato. Um, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> we move on. Uh, so as uh, Dato has said uh, that, you know, he, he <coughs> believes that uh, we should actually have these values that, you know, number one value, uh, human uh, and we have to look at it from human rights perspective. Uh, number three, that we have to uh, understand the supremacy of our constitution uh, and as well as policies made and education. Um, and uh, if I uh, and what sort of education it has to be quality education. But I also want to add, I can't help it. Uh, you know, education as well at home and at school. No indoctrination and brainwashing as well. That though, I, I think that's quite important. So uh, now we move on to um, Mr. Nicholas Muya, um, and uh, we can hear from him. Thank you. Uh, well, <coughs> uh, we. We want to see the, our uh, Malaysian nation as a progressive and uh, really uh, united uh, Malaysian. I think I, w I would like uh, to quote what uh, uh, Dr. Mujahid said this morning is that we have to uh, eliminate the extremism. We have to make sure that the extremism to be out from the agenda of uh, Malaysians uh, 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 minds, you know. So in that case, uh, uh, what I believe is that if that can be a, 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 a general for everybody, is that then uh, the most, if not the most, 
one of the good example we we can uh, practice or see or try to observe is I think none other than the Sarawak state and the Sabah state. For the simple reason is that you see in my family, I'm a very diverse family. My family we have four four race races and four religion. <laughs> yeah. And of course, I'm a big family, and my family, uh, one of my uh, uh, elder sisters married to an Indian from Penang, and he's a Hindu, and another one married to Malay from Kelantan, and convert to uh, Islam, and another one is a Chinese, and of course, in my own family, even in my own family, uh, we are a Christian, and my father, a mother very much like to practice the, the pagan uh, uh, practices, you know. So we are very div uh, diversified, uh, uh, multi-culture, uh, family concern. So uh, what what are the formula? Because uh, I think the most important thing is the the inclusiveness and the social spiritual uh, inclusiveness for everybody. Because. Uh, if, if that happened, other thing we should be talking about uh, extremism, about somebody uh, saying bad things to another group, you know? So, and uh, you see, in, in my family, also, even the language, we don't bother about uh, each, uh, each person's language, even if he talk in there, if I can ask, then I just follow him. And likewise, the, 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 the other families. Yeah, whoever has the dominance uh, topic on that, that will be the language of, uh, of, of speaking for, for the conversation. So, which is very much uh, uh, social and humanized way of trying to as, uh, accepting everybody within the family of, uh, of a Malaysian uh, uh, citizenship. Yeah? And then, of course, uh, you see, even in the celebration, you know, uh, I always tell my friends, even from the Peninsula Malaysia, you know, I think the, the, my, my in-laws, who are Muslim, from Kelantan, and he, she, will, every uh, harvest festival, he must come back to, my, uh, to Sarawak and to my kampong, and bring the whole families, and, and also the children. So the children are mixing very well with the communities. So it humanize everything. So in that, we don't speak about religion. Religion is there, and we also in, uh, in within the family we are very tolerant. You know, if you're Muslim, yeah, you do uh, which part you should be doing, and then you should be choosing your own way of doing things first because we are a little bit weird, and you know, we take everything. You know? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, that doesn't make a difference. I mean, it doesn't really matter. So we are acceptable to. We, uh, we, we we adopt each other uh, situation in the, in the in the families, and likewise the, the Hindus. You know, we if the fellow come, okay, this is you. Then if you don't take the beef, yeah, likewise, no problem with that. You know, that's uh, you you can uh, have it your own first, and then the rest give it to others. And also, even in our social livelihood, there is livelihood. You know what? We are very much still very much practicing uh, farming, uh, farming and hunting. You know what happened? Both of our family, those uh, the Muslim and the non-Muslim, they go something together. And you, if you shoot wild boar, you can shoot, but it will be given to another the one who are not not Muslim. Likewise, if you shoot a deer, and then the deer must go first. He must have it the bigger share for our, our Muslims uh, 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 families. See, this is the thing that uh, I think we should uh, practice and we should tell our, our own people if you want to see a progressive uh, Malaysia. And of course, uh, in terms of childcare, you know, in, in, my, in Sarawak, in Sarawak, even uh, if the, you know, the kindergarten, all races put their children, especially the working parent, put their children of a mixed uh, races of uh, children in, in, in one school. And when they come back, uh, times to come back, and uh, you know the, the the parent will collect everybody and send it to their own on uh, on uh, houses. So it's also likewise come another day, it's another rotation. So it was very peaceful 
way of uh, uh, socializing and mixing with each other. And also in eating places. I think uh, some of you have been coming to Sarawak, you know? In one shop, there are Malay store, and there are Chinese store, and there are Indian store. <coughs> and everybody eating at the same place. And they uh, take their own uh, uh, record, uh, what, what, what is uh, uh, good for them. And they, and they sit in one table. You know, they, they, they are not spreading each other. And then they discuss their common interests and, and their, 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 their work or their business or whatnot. So this is still uh, very much practices in, in, in Sarawak. And of course, uh, the rest have been uh, spoken by Dato, which is very similar to, to, to Sarawak. And what is the, I mean, of course, we have some concern because, in fact, the concern comes from, from outside, not from within Sarawak. You know, it comes for the, for, in many cases, it comes from the peninsula of Malaysia who brings uh, the, the concern that we have in Sarawak. Now, actually, okay, now uh, we are talking about uh, the non Malaysian agreement. It was, and it tends to be quite true when our founding uh, father, then, you know, Apa Juga, what did he, he said at that time, which is very, very uh, uh, talk of the, the committee within Sarawak. Hey, sons. You know, I signed this agreement for the good of everybody and for the good of Malaysia and brothers and sisters. But I have a concern. I caught it's just I'm I'm very worried when I'm not allowed no more in this world. It's just like eating uh, chewing a sugar can. It is very sweet now at the best, but in the, the, at the end it can become sour. So you no, know, that might be the situation when I'm not, and that's the reality now. Yeah, because there are no give and take from both parties who are in the um, so-called memorandum then. So one party they, they interpret things in a, a different way, or, uh, some people also take things on their political interest. I think that which is not, not fair, yeah? not fair to, to those who are weak, especially from the Malaysians, uh, uh, from the Sarawak and Sabah side. And of course, the concern is, as I have said, question, where was it? Yeah, this morning. The concern is now that, yeah, we have uh, been in Malaysia for many, many years, for past 45 years. We thought that we are really in a progressive people. But then again, the genius people, especially the Sarawak, uh, the, I think both Sarawak and Sabah. And until now, they are identity-less. You know? And you said, no, we are Malaysian, but look into the, the standard form for any uh, anything that you want to fill in the government sovereign in the end, whatever government uh, department there. There are no place for the people of Sarawak. So of course they will be getting angry of that. And that is the reason why there are, I think, if not million, thousands of uh, uh, young people, adults, and even children are uh, identity-less. And that is why this couple to the big dropout of the school. Yeah? So this can be seen uh, within all the, the, the interior uh, part of it. We have been trying to, to do that, to help our community. That's why uh, for my institution, we register ourselves with the register, uh, you know, the uh, election commission. The only uh, uh, association or NGOs in Sarawak that have been given so-called the lessons to, to recruit uh, 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 electors so-called to, to do a good uh, government. But then again, the hurdle is that there are still many, many people who are identity, identity -less. So what can we do with that? What, I mean, how, how will we resolve these issues? Yeah? And of course, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of resources, this is uh, another thing. And, and what happens is that, you know, the, uh, the authorities are giving uh, license to uh, uh, powerful people, you know? rich and powerful people. I mean, people in the corridor of power. And it grabs land. So this is the real contingent issue in Sarawak. That's why we have so many cases. That's why you, if you here, if you can can access to any some of their uh, the media, 
and every day the people protest, the people blockage. Why? They are uh, uh, resources creeping, uh, uh, very del de deliberate in, 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 in Sarawak. And of course, it is also not only because that is uh, the issue uh, started within Sarawak, because of the federal government too. They are part of it, uh, they are part uh, to be blamed for, for that matter. And of course, uh, uh, well, of course we have the hope. The hope is that uh, uh, we believe uh, that as uh, been deliberated before this, that people are making laws for the for everybody. But uh, to me, with due respect to city and the lawyers, do shall we believe only the lawyers to do that? <laughs> Yeah, why not indigenous people who knows their their own uh, you know, custom and uh, their needs are not included there? Yeah, to me, uh, not unless everybody uh, brought in board for consultation, I think uh, then we have a good system of government, good laws to cover uh, to rules everybody. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the last uh, that I can say is that. I have been going outside, you know, trying to see what is happening, also how other people govern their own countries. <coughs> so the issues that I can see is that even within the United Nations Charter, even in any platform that people are talking about policies for their own countries, I believe that the Malaysian government, if there is only a third le level of policy uh, decision makers who doesn't have the, the power to decide, and who doesn't have power to, to delegate that to the boss who are in the countries? That's why we are very, as uh, policies, in terms of awareness, in terms of uh, conclusions of within our system. I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you. I was taken aback. They are selling Bobby <laughs> next to ordinary food, you know. Unlike here, all these uh, so-called haram food are all put in the corner. You can't even find it. Oh, okay. You know, not that I'm looking for it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> no, really, I can't uh, believe it, you know. I even took pictures of it, you know, and posted it, and I was like shocked. Uh, and uh, I saw Bobby cigar. Can you imagine those things being written here, you know, the, the Malays, some of the Malays, not all, uh, will go ballistic, you know, like they say, oh, why put Bobby, you know, right in the middle of uh, the, the, the road. It's crazy, but uh, yes, uh, it's brilliant. And I agree that when you make laws, uh, not necessarily just lawyers, we have, we must get input from the indigenous people because they are the people who knows about what they want. You know, we don't know, we only know how to draft. So, um, on that uh, note, I will uh, welcome now Gerald uh, to uh, present his uh, uh, talk. City for moderating uh, and uh, keeping all the guys in check. <laughs> Tantri Simon, uh, Dato Saifuddin and Matthias Muja. Uh, okay. Uh, Trying, we're trying to find out how to overcome challenges in race relations in Malaysia. That's a topic given to us. So, I think many good ideas have been given already, and I think the example of Sarawak, how we live together, perhaps is a good model. Eh? Uh, we have anecdotal stories in Semenanjung of that happening, but it seems like we're referring more to the past than the present. I think uh, maybe sports and other things may 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 be able uh, to do something. The mama, uh, the the mama stall uh, solution that was spoken about by Professor Shamsho to be one. Uh, before I, I give my my idea of it, I just want to actually pick up where Dato Ambiga spoke. I think to address the issue, we need to know. I think uh, Ahmad from was it Ahmad or someone said that we need to recognize first. We need to recognize the problem. Uh, sorry, I think Paul said the UK you need to recognize. So. Uh, my first point is that uh, we need to recognize that we can't have a schizophrenic government. That's number one. Huh? I think you can't have one government who speaks two, three, four languages. Some examples, uh, when Mandela, Mandela was mentioned earlier, when Mandela passed away, we were all very sad, but then Tunku Adnan said that AMNO is a party that believes in anti apartheid and we were shocked. Then uh, Surendran said that it can't be true, you are the one promoting apartheid, and then he was called mad. 
So at one side they said we are like Mandela struggle to unite, but on another end they will say we are defending Malay rights, we are under siege. So I, I, can't, I can't imagine how can one person speak two languages to different audiences, but maybe they are all trained as good actors, you know, all this in the political parties. Another schizophrenia is that we have a beautiful Malaysia. We've seen these pictures, right? One Malaysia, what Malaysia through the Asia. This is you Google, you can get all this. Uh, then you get this uh, Prime Minister Najib also expounding his one Malaysia. So you say, wow. Uh, Professor Shamsul called this illusory unity, yeah? uh, whether this is real. But on the other hand, you see this. We also have the not so beautiful Malaysia, the cowhead protest, small groups of people trying to instigate. You see this picture of Perkasa waving the, the crease and reminding uh, people about who this nation belongs to and the whole concept of uh, Katwanan. So the government must decide which is, which is it what type of government it is today. And I think Barisan National should be clear. I mean, it's okay for governments to be either one, but at least we should know what game plan. You cannot speak here one language and then go to the UN and speak another uh, language. Eh? We need to decide if we are truly an open society or a closed one, you know. One message we got, we're going to repeal sedition because we are in track to change, to modernize, uh, reform, so we got the promise by our own Prime Minister and then now there's a whole fervor to keep sedition and Tan Sri Simon has been visited by the police the last two weeks. Eh? And then I think uh, Professor Aziz Bari this morning also uh, hundred people made a police report. So it's going, so now we're not sure which is it again. So I think we need to ask the policy makers government, which are you? And then with that we can formulate a uh, a uh, response. So maybe we need to form a response for a schizophrenic kind of, of, of situation. So what we have is uh, all of us finding space to talk in the mama shop or the Tetare store. That's where most of us feel safe, feel brani, feel very daring. You know, we give the most articulate because we know after that the mama fellow will clean your drink and then you can continue life. You know, you pay the money and you go. So. Oh, why, why are we left with this kind of, uh, of, of situation? So, sedition law, you know, actually hampers uh, discussion because everything is so regulated. So, which are we again? An open society? They, because this whole notion of moving towards first world developed nation comes with it a certain kind of notion of a society. But, so you are, it really makes us confused. We are following which trend of the government? Then the next one is, uh, this is Tun Badawi's uh, uh, very poignant summary of the country, you know. Our, we are a first world nation with first world infrastructure but third world mentality. So which are we again? First world or third world, you know, with all the projection that we need to move up, a yeah, high income uh, nation. Are we a critical thinking nation or a subservient nation? Meaning that we have to listen to pronouncement by ministers, by government, what to say, what to do, how to behave. Oh, actually, it's okay. Like this forum, it's okay to talk. People have different ideas. You can disagree. Uh, this morning, uh, our MP uh, Mujahid and City were discussing whether he should remain in pass or not. You know, so <laughs> it is okay to discuss, but that's critical thinking spaces. But is that encouraged or not? You know. So that's the third dilemma that uh, our schizophrenic uh, Malaysia is at at this point. It was not like this before. I think like before it was a bit more clear the direction. Are we a moderate or an extremist society? This is uh, uh, Prime Minister Najib's speech a few days ago. Huh? We reject the so-called Islamic State. We reject the state defined by extremism and we condemn the violence being committed in the name of Islam. So this was a wonderful speech. You say yes. Then, on the 20th anniversary of the Chiras Amno branch uh, last month of July, he called on party members to emulate the exploits of the group which was then known as the Islamic State in Iraq and the ISIL, as its members were able to defeat an Iraqi force despite being outnumbered. So, again, you get the same man speaking two messages and two. So, which are we? Are we a moderate society? 
ग्लोबल मोटर मूवमेंट डायरेक्टर इसी है सो दैट इज आई बोलूँ स्टार्स टू मेक मलेशिया अ नेशन ऑफ मॉडरेट्स यू नो सो वी ऑल विथ हिम ऑन दिस ऑन दिस प्लान बट आवर नेशनल लीडर्स आर गिविंग टू मैसेजेस सो व्हाट डू वी डू इज मलेशिया ट्रूली अ रिप्रेजेंटेटिव नेशन एन इंक्लूसिव नेशन और ऑल मलेशिया सेगमेंटेड सेगमेंटेड नेशन ऑफ नेगोशिएशन ऑफ नेशन यू नो So you see this as being sold. I think this was what Prof. Shamsul said that uh, Malaysia truly Asia. We are really good for photographs and pictures. Brilliant, uh, beautiful. Oh, this is the real Malaysia. The billboards of uh, parties and organisations and societies divided by our ethnic background or our racial uh, composition. So which is it again? So I think this is the background which we have not decided. What's the type of nation we want to form? And I think the majority, the 99 percent that Prof. Chamshul said, is actually the moderates. That 99 percent we need to decide and tell the government this is the type of Malaysia we want. Because if not, that one percent that he spoke about this morning will be setting the agenda, and that agenda is spoken through some ministers in the cabinet who keeps giving reminders to all of us. Uh, what, uh, which direction to go or not to go? So I would say it's it's time now for change. But what do we do? Do we wait or let's move forward and leave behind races and bigots? Because I think the 99 percent have to tell the one percent that this nation does not belong to you. Whatever you can say, because if you can prove your history, the 99 percent can also tell you another history. So finally, whose history is going to be correct? I mean, Dr. Saifuddin already pointed out how you read the constitution. Is it Malay rights or special position? Even that, already the reading is different. He's just pointed out it's not rights. It's a position limited by scope, by definition. But there are groups who are saying, even by me mentioning that now, it's seditious because they say I'm challenging one fact. But I'm not. I'm stating what is obviously in the constitution, as Dr. Saifuddin has, has said. So. The 99 percent needs to decide what kind of nation we want. I think, based on that, then I think overcoming the challenges would be much more easier for for all of us to go forward. I think from morning till now we've got ideas, what needs to be done and what needs to be uh, broken. But one of it, of course, is the rewriting of history. We got a lesson of history yesterday by another forum, Tan Sri Simon and Jeffrey Kittingan gave us the history books of the Malaysia Agreement. You know, many of us are clueless what happened in history. I think the history of Semenanjung, Sabah, Sarawak, many of us are clueless because history books are so inadequate. The education ministry is so inadequate in trying to bring the nation forward. So, perhaps some suggestions that I would want to make as we uh, uh, come to the end of this session is maybe break our silo mentality. We need to decide if we are one nation of Malaysia or we are a few nations in Malaysia. Because if you think that the nation is beholden to people who came here, uh, the first people, uh, the Malay community, but which Malay community? Because when I say that, immediately my orang asli friends at the back are going to stand up and say, "But my grandfather and grandmother came here before you." So we can play the number game. We can go back uh, anthropologically, historically, go back way back. Like we can ask our Sarawak uh, Iban and orang Kenya, orang Bulu, and the uh, Sabahan. How many generations? How many thousands of years ago? Then it's going to be a number game. Who will finally win to say that this land belongs to me? We will never win that game. So we need to come out of that segmented thinking that this nation belongs to one group who can decide for all. I think the other one I would say is that uh, we cannot promote fear of interreligious discussion. I think that's that's really going in the wrong direction. We may disagree. We may have different of opinion. But once you label uh, discussing religion in the country as challenging religion, I think that's a wrong notion. And I think that's why you see the police report crew who keeps going around every police station and making the reports every time. You know, it's very easy. Ten people make a report, the police gets into action. You know, there's some reports outstanding for ten years on serious crimes. Uh, nothing has been done. So I would believe that one religious conviction won't disappear because others speak about their religion. And I believe you may be Muslim, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist. Your religious conviction never disappears because somebody else is speaking about their religion. At the most, you learn something new. 
uh, at the worst, you ask some questions about your own faith. But that's the that's process of life. The third point I want to make is that I think we must reject superiority is negative, full stop. There are no two ways about it. Any group, any individual stating that this land belongs to me, this country belongs and you shut up, we have to tell them to shut up also. You know? Superiority does not work, you know, because in the principle of non-discrimination and equality than you or I have more than you. Any group expounding this, and you know the groups that we who have been spewing out this kind of messages, you know, groups like Isma and Perkasa, so negative and so threatening to other people who ask for equality to define what's happening to our country, threats. And this superiority is negative and it's a no-go. If we are believing in a Malaysia that my, Prime Minister Najib is selling to the world in the United Nations that Malaysia is a model, moderate nation for the world. You can't sell moderate, modern nation in the world in New York when nobody knows what's happening in Malaysia. But when you come to Malaysia, Prime Minister Najib is silent on moderation. He accepts on, he expects only Datuk Saifuddin to do the work through GMMF. But that's not enough. We need the cabinet to speak the same language of New York in Malaysia. I think the point I've made, openness in critical discourse, I think it's okay for us to talk, to sit down, to discuss different ideas of it. All of us cannot agree on everything. You know? And I think an example to prove in point is that when we were in the coalition of Malaysian NGOs uh, for the UPR, there were groups attacking our human rights report in the UN saying that we were anti-freedom of religion or we were pro-LGBT. Neither of that was what we were doing. We were just stating 10 pages of report of everything. So we were saying, why don't we sit down and talk? I don't expect you to agree with everything I say, but if we can sit down and talk and find which part of human rights and what's the issue, that's the way to go forward. I'm sure we'll find a way to still coexist and to work as partners. But now some of the groups we are dialoguing with, eh? some of the Muslim groups have broken away from MUPRO and individually like the Muslim lawyers, like Abim, uh, we are having dialogue with them on trying to understand each other and see how to take it forward. I think that is also trying to negotiate some kind of dialogues of this nature. So I think that's what I think we need an openness in a, uh, in a critical discourse. I think there was mention need to educate the young in moderation and not copying extremism. This is serious now because I was just having a discussion, you know, the question of how come young people are saying yes to go and fight the jihad wars in, in Syria? I mean, uh, where did they get this idea? Somebody must be telling them or putting some things in their mind. Why are you taking up bombs to kill yourself, you know, for a war that is now deemed as Prime Minister Najib? That is not Islam. But there are young people who are being recruited. How come, how come our young people who's educated, who's far better than 30 years ago, is so easily duped by recruiters getting them to fight the war in Syria, in Iraq for this uh, model of, of Islamic country. Uh, I think this is my point earlier, you know, consistent and honest politics, but this is a big challenge. Eh? I think uh, very few politicians stand up to the test. Maybe that side Putin is one of the few. Uh, some of the op uh, politicians in PKR uh, past recently also stood up against Hadi Awang. Has been branded. So whenever you stand up against the tide, you are branded as not being loyal to your party. But I think these are honest politicians and I think we need to breed more honest politicians. Criminalized hate speech, I think uh, we can learn a lot from Paul's uh, experience in the UK. How we should not allow people to, to go. But also I think the draft bill by NUCC is very good because it's balancing... When I read the draft proposal by NUCC, it was balancing uh, criminalizing hate speech and freedom of expression. Very clear, they don't want to take away the right. So we, it seems it can be, it can work hand in hand because there's an incitement to violence that, 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 that uh, must come if you want to criminalize hate speech. Professionalize civil service to be Malaysian centric and not ethnocentric. See, I'm not even saying kick out the 90% Malay civil service and make it 50%. That's, that will come in due time. But even whoever is in position now, you are duty bound by your oath to serve all Malaysians, full stop. Doesn't matter who walks in and what the person thinks and feels, how he looks, how she smells, doesn't matter, you know? Doesn't matter. You just have professionally to take care of, of, of them. I'm coming to the last two points. Then, uh, 
Is, uh, I think someone also spoke about human rights education. Huh? Uh, we don't have a syllabus of human rights education in our school. I mean, uh, that was a deputy education, high, uh, higher education. I don't know what was your struggle there, trying to institute this. But even at the basic education, Philippines 20 years ago already has uh, in its primary education, human rights education. It's a subject matter. We are trying, I think, so how come you can ask us, so how come colleagues there, the staff there, they've been trying for 10 years with five schools, uh, sampling five schools, maybe it's opened up a bit more. Uh, okay, this is my final point. Uh, uh, send ministers and political leaders for detox programs and rehabilitation centers <laughs> to take away that, 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 that race, whatever bitterness or pill that is stuck in the blood. I mean, all of us need this detox program, but because we need our political leaders to lead the way. But if they are stuck with this, I don't know what program we can do. Maybe GMMF has, can do some program. Huh? They may come to your program. If only all this works, if only we could all play sports and find solutions to Malaysia, it would be so easy. This is a, a photo that I took in a futsal when I used to play. Young people just sitting to play, you know, there's uh, all kinds of uh, ethnic groups there sitting, and they don't really care about all these big issues we're talking. They just want to play. Exactly. They're all sweating, waiting to get in, and all focused on the game. If only Malaysia could be this easy, people's focus is on something bigger, something larger than us. But the track to this, is a long track, huh? uh, and I think we uh, we should work together. My final slide is to call on all of us that uh, they're going to call us names. They're going to call Tansri Simon for investigation. That those will be coming up soon. No, no, I got no prediction. I have no information about you. <laughs> I have no friends in the police, but I'm saying that uh, since you mentioned Mandela, I put in this slide. I was called a terrorist yesterday. But when I came out of jail, many people embraced me, including my enemies. And that is what I normally tell other people who say those who are struggling for liberation in their countries are terrorists. So don't mind the labeling. Uh, history will, will take away the label and change you to be a, a liberator for, for human rights. With that, thank you very much. Now we have... Let's see. Right, uh, we have 15 minutes at least for Q&A. Uh, so, we are opening the floor. Everyone, my name is Jiana from Project Dialogue. Uh, Datuk Saifuddin, I would just like to pick your brains on something. Um, there are some people who would say that politics and religion should be separated altogether. Do you agree with this statement? And if you agree that politics and religion should be separated, is this something that is realistic, number one? And number two, if you disagree and you think that the interrelations between politics and religion are in, in, is inevitable, then to what extent should the involvement be between politics and religion? Number two, do you see a problem with institutionalized religion? And also number three, just to share with you, I'm not sure if you're aware, but recently there was, uh, we just concluded the first round table for um, interfaith dialogue in ASEAN region. And we actually um, came up with an Ayutthaya declaration which um, promotes harmony uh, within the religious um, circles. So I think that would be very good if we can promote um, that between um, everyone here. And also, lastly, I would like to respond to um, Gerald. You were mentioning about education on human rights. I'm not sure if you're aware, but there are certain religious quarters in Malaysia who are ideologically against the idea of human rights and also freedom in Malaysia. So thank you very much. Ms. Fredaus, yes, from the Malaysian Bar. I have two questions uh, for Dr. Saifuddin and also for Mr. Nicholas Nujak. Uh, my question to Dr. Saifuddin is that uh, you mentioned about supremacy of the Constitution. Uh, so, you know, looking at the number of amendments that was made to the Constitution, and I'm, I'm guessing including minor amendments, it's almost over 500 amendments. Uh, do you agree with me that in Malaysia, the federal constitution is seen as an ordinary piece of legislation just like you know any other acts of parliament so that's one and following up from that um can i suggest maybe nucc would like to do a crash course on constitution to all the members of parliament then, so that they know about the of the constitution <laughs> so that's for uh that, that's what separate in and, and to mr nicholas muja um, I just would like to know what are the sentiments of the people in Sabah and Sarawak 
towards what's happening in the peninsula with regards to the uh, racial and religious clashes uh, happening now. Yeah. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Misha from Lawyers for Liberty. I've got a few lengthy questions, but <laughs> it's not uh, so long, darling. Yeah, not so long, not so long. But uh, it's across the board uh, for everybody. First of all, is that uh, I've heard the previous people also admitting to this that there's a lot of failure in the legislation, but not enough emphasis on the failure of social institutions. I understand that we've been coming to schools where schools are racist. However, we have failed to grasp the fact that, not just with actual schools, as uh, Dato has said, it's also Sekolah uh, Kebangsaan, where we have Abama, when you are seven, you are separated from your friends who are Muslim on day one. You don't know what they study, they go to Abama class, and there is a sense why can they study their religion when non-Muslims are around. So from there, the sense of profanity is always linked to being non-Muslim. And then so that's already a very glaring point in the first main social institution. Then we also have the families and religious classes. I mean, I, I don't know what happens anywhere else, but I have been to church and you know, smaller. And when there have been fairly racist sentiments, even in church, where you can't be friends with people who worship idols. And these are very, it's fairly moving. My, my church has not created any terrorists. But this, and they would be considered fairly moderate. So what about people that are even more extremist? We have failed to realize that it's everywhere. And how do we go head to head? Yes, we want them to be more moderate, but when we are faced with somebody in our families, somebody who's a friend who is extremely racist and will not engage, how do we go past that? And then my second question is about the question of citizenship. Because as we say, we've always been dubbed as Pandak. It's not open for anybody again, because I want to pick everybody's brain on this. Whenever we are declared Pandatak, especially when we're Chinese or Indian, it is technically delegitimizing citizenship. And this argument has never really been taken up. As soon as you call us Pandatak, that would mean that you do not take the concept of citizenship seriously. That's the debate of multiculturalism abroad. But if we do hold coherently to the debate of citizenship and say, yes, we're all citizens, we're all equal, then we delegitimize the importance of birth because a lot of people who are born in Malaysia, but because of the fault of not being registered, their belonging is also delegitimized. So we are faced with these two. Could you think of a narrative of belonging that will not delegitimize any form of belonging, citizenship as well as just belonging, if anybody has any idea, because the narrative of citizenship has not been brought up and I would like to see it brought up more because there has been no respect for citizenship and the rule of law. So perhaps if I could pick your brain, like how do you think of a good narrative of belonging across the board for everybody else? Okay, thank you. Okay, Nora. Pada Dato' Syafuddin, saya percaya segala masalah rasism kita adalah berpunji daripada politik, okay? Saya nak tanya Dato, pernah ke perkara-perkara ini dibincangkan di dalam mesyuarat uh, tertinggi UMNO? Uh, misalnya bagaimana punca, kemudian bagaimana untuk mengatasi Kerana saya juga dulu di dalam UMNO, cuma laptop saya mungkin rendah, saya hanya di peringkat bahagian Bila saya bawa masalah ini ke peringkat bahagian, bahagian tak akan terima Mereka kata ketua anak Melayu itu lebih tinggi, jadi inilah sebenarnya antara punca uh, resism itu berlaku Jadi, saja Terima kasih Yana, itu dah satu lecture tu nak jawab Ok, uh, masa saya keluar, when, when I left university uh, in 84 And I decided in 86 to join a political party, I chose Barisan National But I cannot be a member of BN, so I have to be a member of UMNO Because uh, direct membership, uh, there's no real direct membership, not yet in Barisan National So that explain whether I actually believe in you know having Uh, label uh, Islam as a label in, in, in politics uh, but I do recognize that religion can play a role provided you know how to do it now from there on let me say this then what do you do for people who believe that uh, say in the context of Islam because there are Christian parties uh, in, in a very strong uh, Christian 
uh, caucus in the EU Parliament, uh, <laughs> for instance. Uh, in fact, I think the biggest caucus in the EU Parliament is uh, Christian-based uh, 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 parties uh, from Germany, especially. Uh, of course, there are social democrats being the second, probably biggest uh, caucus in the EU. Now, to be practical, then, how do you handle uh, people who uh, who believe? Uh, that religion in this context, Islam, has a role in politics. I think it is important that we engage them, we motivate and encourage them to have a progressive interpretation of Islamic politics. Uh, I know I'm into I'm not into semantics. Yeah. I'm being very very brief here. Yeah. And there are people who now uh, use a new concept called Makasid Sharia, uh, realizing the objective of the Sharia. And uh, a very good example will be people like Dr. Mujahid, Dr. Zul in the past. Uh, uh, and and Nahda Pati uh, under Ganushi in Tunisia, for instance. These are Islamist moderate, as they call themselves. Uh, people, uh, Islamist Democrats. They are Democrats. They are, they are by definition Democrat. They happen to be uh, Muslim and they happen to be belonging to this kind of political parties. And I think they are making headways. And in that, in those kind of situations, you have to appreciate why they are like that. Yeah, I'll give you another example. Uh, you are faced, for instance, in Egypt, Ekwan. They are still the strongest, most organized organization you want you want to engage them or you want to fight them i choose to engage them and i think it is best that they believe in democracy rather than they don't believe in democracy and i've been telling to some people uh, who put pressure on the qatar government to chase out uh, ibrahim and the other uh, the secretary general of ehwan uh, egypt uh, out of qatar i said this is a wrong move it's better to have them in Qatar than not knowing where they are. And it's better to have them in Qatar where they are in close proximity to moderate ulama. I don't like to use this term, lah, but, but you know, for, for lack of a better way of saying it, to have uh, people like Madani and, uh, I was sorry, sorry, uh, Kadawi and uh, alongside them, rather than not knowing who they are talking to and, and where they are. Uh, so, so you have to engage them. I, I'm not saying I'm... I'm, 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 I'm that kind and I'm, I'm, otherwise I will be a member of PAS. But you have to engage them and you have to in, try to influence them that uh, there are progressive ways of doing things. Yeah? Not engaging them or, uh, uh, you know, uh, fighting them is not, is, not, uh, is, not, uh, is not an answer. And I just came back uh, from a short trip to uh, EU, uh, meeting some parliamentarians and officers, and uh, in, in, in having a roundtable discussion in Paris. There are intellectuals in the West who understand this thing is happening. Because you cannot have continuous, uh, what do you call, uh, 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 not contestation, but fight between this is Islamophobia story. You, you can't have the West looking at Muslim in a certain way and Muslim looking at the West. No. You must remember, Malaysia is part of the world nowadays. We, we are part of Southeast Asia, we are part of the world. We need to be able to, to bridge the gap. And I think it is very important that we bridge the gap. Am I promoting Islamic politics? Nahi. <laughs> All I'm trying to say is, because they, are, and they have the right to do that, and you have to engage them, and you have to, 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 to what do you call, uh, um, uh, uh, encourage them uh, to, be, to be progressive. Uh, institutionalized religion, if you, are, if you ask me, I, I don't believe in it, but if you are in Malaysia, you have to live with it. Again, the question is, how do you behave as a Muslim? Uh, okay, there is Article uh, 3. Yeah, but you must read the whole article rather than reading it halfway that Islam is, again, it's not the official religion, it's the religion of the federation. Two different things altogether. Yeah. And then there is the second part of the provision that all uh, other religions can be practiced. Some people stop at that. You must continue in peace and harmony. I mean, these are two powerful words. And then how do you, how do you act as a Muslim if it happens to be 
uh, in government. Then you have to act like Rasulullah, Prophet, peace be upon him. When he was uh, uh, there, how he relate to the to the Christians of Najran and many other, uh, uh, to the Jews and so on and so forth. So there are ways of doing it. So, okay, so okay, now it's in the constitution, they're going to fight, but okay. So what do you do? Then you have to behave uh, in uh, uh, as a good Muslim. And a good Muslim is rahmatan lil alamin, is mercy to all. You cannot be, uh, oh, because it is there and therefore, as a Muslim, you know, I tekan you, I tekan there, I seize your Bible and sebagainya. That's not Islamic. Islam means, you, you live as a Muslim lah. Okay, uh, because because you don't think you want to amend the constitution. But as it is, because it is there. You see, I'm, I'm being very practical. It is there. I'm not going to argue about it. Not yet, not, not now, not yet. Yeah, it's very seditious, you know, if you want to argue about that. <laughs> but then if you are a Muslim, then live, you know, as a, as a Muslim, as a good Muslim. Not, not uh, someone who is unfair. Uh, on your last point, uh, I think we should sit down uh, with Denison uh, because I think uh, both of us and a few of us in this room are also involved in another project. Uh, the one that I was alluding to when I started, the religious freedom thing, I think uh, that is something that I think we can work. It is very important that we understand uh, because even among Muslim scholars, we need to, redef we need to really understand uh, what it means. Sometimes you say it is in the Quran. Actually, it is not because someone say it is in the Quran, yeah, and 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 then you get into trouble. Wow, uh, supremacy, <laughs> freedom, of supremacy of the constitution. Yes, I believe in it. Okay, it has been amended to the extent so many times to the extent that it looks like ordinary. You know why? Because sometimes people just fail to understand what it, I, I, I quote you an example. Why we we amended the constitution during Mahadev's time about the agong having to sign. I mean, if, we if everybody understand uh, what is known as convention, because we follow the Westminster system, we don't, really, we don't have to amend it. Uh, if agong at that time, well, now, I, now I'm entering this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if everyone, <laughs> oops, if everyone understand uh, the spirit of the, of the constitution and then look at Convention, then you don't have to amend that part of the constitution, for instance. But amending Article 8 to include gender is very important because we signed that convention on uh, on women. Uh, so some are very necessary, some are really not. But uh, I think uh, NUCC uh, is proposing that the government uh, look at uh, constitution education. Maybe we can start with the MPs, I don't know. Uh, uh, Michelle. If only we can do sekolah wawasan, again I'm being very practical here, but not in the form of the four sekolah wawasan, the pilot project. That was very expensive. You actually have uh, 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 three schools, you know, sekolah kebangsaan here, sekolah, uh, you, you, they actually built new one. New sekolah kebangsaan, new SJKC, new SJKT, share the field, share the hall and share the canteen. Now that's very expensive. But we can, ex the problem is somehow it was shut down after uh, the, the project was shut down. It was supposed to be a pilot. I think what we need to do is to revisit sekolah wawasan more in spirit rather than the, the, the physical. Getting our kids to mix with each other. Uh, to interact and sports uh, would be one of the <coughs> one of the most important, I think, uh, uh, you know, a uh, uh, platform. Just one minute more. Yeah, Dola. The problem is, well, uh, I was in the Amno Supreme Council for four years. I was deputy uh, ketua bahagian for I think five years. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. We don't really discuss this. Uh, but beyond that, I think, and this is what I thought Chiwi was alluding to early on. Uh, Chiwi was talking about power. Uh, I have to be more politically politically correct lah. Uh, besides power, yeah, tapi kata politically correct. <laughs> uh, some of us don't seem to be able to understand that the Malaysian electorate have said goodbye to two third majority. So, uh, yeah, how, 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 to, how to administer, how to be a government, there's no more to third majority. And then, and then you don't know how to govern when there are states which are under uh, opposition. That is why you, you, you sometimes find it very strange that some of my colleagues, you know, when they are in Penang, they call uh, uh, the Penang government the opposition government. <laughs> 
you know. But my colleagues on the other side also sometimes got difficulties in trying to identify <laughs> who is government. Lah. Yeah, I think I think we we all have to 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 come to uh, to understand uh, the current political scenario that there can be people you know in in government, there can be people in the position. Uh, that tilted majority is like, uh, well, we don't know what's going to happen in the next general election, but I hope we continue not having tilted majority. Then we have to learn how to negotiate, you know. And, and you see, some people thought that now we cannot even amend constitution because there's no tilted majority. No, tilted majority is not measured by the number of BN seats, my dear. Tilted majority is measured by the support of the MPs in Parliament to the motion to amend which part of the constitution. So these are the kind of thing I think people are slowly trying to understand and how to, you know, behave accordingly, uh, both as politicians, as officials, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Two things, um, as far as Sabah is concerned on religion, um, as I emphasized during my earlier uh, presentation during North Borneo times we had no problem with Allah <laughs> what the non-Muslim are very confused now is when before we became part of Malaysia we could pray using the word Allah no Muslim ever um, protested no Muslim ever got confused but 51 years later when we use that now, they get confused. So this is something non-Muslim uh, a bit confused themselves. Why they are confused? <laughs> Another point. When I was in the human rights, I uh, most of my job was to sit in the office and uh, listen to aduan lah, complaints. One, uh, I think, which is typical maybe, but, but I cite one case that came to me, and his name is Peter Said Ali. Now, there was a time when there was a gerakan uh, operation to change the, my, the old identity card, the Bunga Raya card, into my card. And he came to me and said, my goodness, I got my card, and I'm labeled now Muslim. I have never been a Muslim, I have never known what it is like to be a Muslim, and I am now great under pressure, he said. And I said, why are you under pressure? He said, when I die, they will berebut my mayat. Itu yang saya takut, while I'm still alive. They will shame about their, their own property according to the Sharia law. So he was under stress. Not so much because of the religion, because of what he witnessed was happening so this is a kind then we have cases my father had a bin in his name but he was before malaysia now we have a lot of cases where bin and binti becomes part of their name mr a bin so and so uh, one a binti so and so but when the my card comes out they label muslim uh, then they got problem Technique, theoretically they can go back and complain, but they have got to the Sharia court. But then they are non-Muslim, how can the Sharia court? And I don't, I cannot imagine the Sharia court uh, converting them back to non-Muslim because legally and officially they are Muslim. So this is, uh, and not only a, a few, quite a number actually. So these are being raised by the uh, non-Muslim in Sabah now. And all this never happened before Malaysia. So basically, this is a post-Malaysia um, issues. Uh, just briefly on the citizenship. <coughs> In the case of Sabah, there are a lot of citizens now who are not eligible to become citizens. You know, so that's uh, one issue. The other thing is, um, there are a lot of locals who should be citizen, but unable to become citizen simply because of documentation. When I was born, I never had a birth certificate because my parents did not know what to do when I was born. Plan maybe a coconut to mark the birth. <laughs> when only when I 
I only knew I, ha I needed a birth certificate when I applied for Colombo Plan Scholarship and got one and uh, was going to New Zealand. I said, you need a passport. And I didn't know what the passport was. So I went here and there, angkat tangan, sign, sign. Then the part. So I got the passport. But I had, on, before the passport, a late registration. So that was the case. And there are a lot of native in the remote areas of Sabah still have got this problem. So you have this abnormality. Those who are supposed to, you know, who never left their village, for example, are I mean, stateless people. And yet those who are stateless and who should be stateless got citizenship. And I will not be, I'm not surprised a lot of them have already come here. Um, this is the problem. When you start talking, hard to stop. But when I look at her, I have to stop. <laughs> yeah, okay, yes, just to, to answer uh, yeah. Fidaus, yeah. I think for Sarawak, uh, uh, per se, I don't think we have any problem with that. Because uh, the only issues is that uh, the, the activities of some, uh, what we call it, uh, fanatics, uh, religious, uh, so-called uh, missionaries. For example, I just got uh, you one example, just two example, uh, one example. Uh, one, okay, people like that talk here. When they come there, everybody is think from both the uh, political divide, no problem with it, including our sir. But if you were to send Brahim Ali to Sarawak, even the, the Barisan government will object him from that, because why? He is just too, too extremist or too fanatic in that matter. So in terms of, uh, as I said, uh, uh, what, uh, how do we feel it? To, to, I think uh, most, most of us, as I said, you know, we are, uh, if you are my, my guest, so in, in our uh, custom, I regard you as my family. So you are being in family. So the region is not, not that matter. So it's the, just the activity. I think that's that my answer. Gerald, would you like to say anything? Just a very quick one. Okay, uh, just a quick one. I think a uh, question of uh, definitions, citizenship, uh, two things, whether it's administration or identity. <coughs> identity is political, uh, a need for administration, um, uh, 